Good morning. Hello, everybody, this morning. Welcome to Bandwidth Beth on this beautiful little overcast Wednesday here in Ojai. Very, very happy to be here and hope that you guys are all excited for my guest this morning. I know I'm excited. It's a thrill and an honor for me to have my friend and doctor, Dr. Michael Lawton, uh, the CEO and president of Barrow Neurological Institute, joining us this morning to talk about bravery and courage. So really, really excited. Good morning, Jen. Thanks for joining. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very personal story that I'm telling with Would You Hide Me? It's a family story. It's a passion project, but it digs deep into, I guess, just the generations of what it is that it means to be connected to survivors and also those who perished in the Holocaust. So it's something that I'm deeply curious about and how people make the choice to do something that is brave and courageous, such as hiding my mom and her six siblings for two years, uh, you know, east of Berlin during World War II. So um, I'm really, really excited to have everybody uh, meet my friend, Dr. Michael Lawton, and let me see if I can bring him on here right now. Let's see. There we go. There he is. I'm sensed. And we'll see if he can join. Um, we're just waiting to see. So how is everybody today? Is everybody kind of getting settled a little bit? Uh, it's Wednesday. We're closer to the weekend. Oh, there you are. Here I am. <laughs> I'm so excited. Hi. Hi. I can't see myself. Are you, you seeing you me? Oh, I can see you. You should be able to see yourself. It should be kind of like a split screen. Either like I see myself on top and you're underneath. Are you landscape or are you which you should be up your phone should be up and down. I'm up and down. Okay, um, good. But you still can't see yourself? Well, you look see. great. You look oh, terrific. thank you. Thank you. It says, <laughs> Beth Lane Film wants you to be live in this video. Go live with Beth Lane. Okay. okay. And you can accept the request. But I think you've already accepted. Okay. So then I'll... Oops. Okay. So he left, but he's going to join again. So that's okay. We'll try it again. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We will work out this little uh, technical detail, but that's what live on Instagram is all about. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like the Wild West going to a rodeo. So let's see if he's able to. I'm going to try and, and invite you again. There we go. And we'll try it again and see. Okay, there you are. Okay. I, I see you again. Do you see me this time or do you see yourself? I don't see myself, but um, I don't know. I don't know. The it's answer. like the app is, is having an issue. Yeah, I think it's a problem with the app. But, but they can see you, As right? long as you can see me and I don't need to see myself, then I think we're good. Okay. Can you see me? I can see you clear. Oh, yes. good. Okay. So you can see like all my crazy facial expressions and you yes, can respond. Can. Okay. <laughs> well, I think everyone can see um, you. And okay. um, for example, uh, like Jen is on here. Jen, let me know if you cannot see our friend, Dr. Michael Lawton, because that would be helpful to know if, if the audience can't see you, I want them to see you. We can always start the bell over again. But um, so far, so good. I think, I think so far, so good. Well, I'm sorry that you can't see yourself, but in the replay, after this is finished, people will be able to see IGTV, the post, and they'll also be able to see it on YouTube and but if you would prefer we can always hang up and we can start all over again it's up to it's completely up to your schedule your schedule is a lot tighter than mine on i think i'm good as long as okay is you're happy if you're happy with how i'm centered and you can see me and uh, then i'm good yes good good okay. good yes i can i can i can that's awesome <laughs> oh yeah okay i'm getting some feedback now i need to, I need to tip this down a little bit that way Oh, that's better. And the lighting's better, too. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You can tip it down even a teeny bit more because um, we have a lot of headroom. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. 
All right. You Perfect. Are, okay. You're camera ready. All right. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Brianne. Appreciate that. Too, too much. A little bit. You're good. Okay. Thank you, Team Lawton over there. Thank you for helping out. Um, yeah. Good morning. Morning. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing really well. It's beautiful here in Ojai today. It's a little overcast. Went for a hike this morning. And one of the things about you that I always think is so fun is to find out like what you did this morning because you're you're like kind of one of these not just weekend warriors but daily warriors and so forth um yeah well i pride myself on my morning routine um usually wednesday since i don't go to the room a little time which means instead of a 60 minute bike ride a 90 minute two hour bike ride but unfortunately this morning i had to uh, wake up and give lecture in, uh, I think it was uh, in Asia. It oh, was wow. a lecture uh, to the Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons, um, 3,000 people at 6 o'clock in the morning in pitch black. So uh, I didn't get my usual workout. Oh, well, I'm sure you'll get it some way somehow. And if not yeah. today, tomorrow. But, Take um, you know, I remember. So I want to just tell the audience how we know each other a little bit. So. Dr. Michael Lawton, who, you know, you're going to kill me, and I'm sure your media team will kill me, but I used to get to call you Mikey. <laughs> so that's how long ago we've known each other. And, um, and I remember I was very good friends with your sister and your sister, Lori, and we were biology lab partners, and we were driver's ed partners. So we did kind of scary things like dissecting frogs, and she wouldn't touch it. She absolutely wouldn't touch it. I had to do all the dirty work. And little did we know that we could have just turned to you, Lori's little brother, to say, you cut this thing open and tell us how to do it. And I think about that a lot and what you're doing with your life and what you've been doing with your life these last, what is it? Funny how in life, um, because of the alphabet, um, you and my sister went through all of these pairings together. On the plane, go, hey, and it, I had the, the same, my class, I had classmate Pat Week, L-E, and I was L-E. You would be paired up a lot. Uh, you, you just end up a lot through the. Yes, for sure, for sure. Um, the audio right now, where you are, it's cutting in and out a little bit. So I'm hearing kind of every other word that you're saying. And I just want to make sure from our audience that they're getting all, everything that you're saying. So um, if anyone can just kind of chime in on the feed here and let us know that you're hearing everything that Dr. Lawton's saying, I think that's really important. Uh, we'll get a couple responses here perhaps. And, but let's just carry on until someone says that they can't, they can't oh, it's fine, they hear everything. Perfect, good, 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 good. Um, but yeah, these pairings, these pairings that we have, uh, they kind of last a lifetime and how lucky for me that I got paired with Lori so that we could continue this friendship years and decades later. And, um, and it's, it's really quite remarkable. It really, really is. You mentioned something to me, I guess about a month ago when we were setting this up that, uh, and we'll get to your career in just a moment, but, but you mentioned something that I could tell that you were very proud of and I really want to acknowledge it and pat you on the back for it. You have, Ten thousand followers, over ten thousand followers on Instagram. That's huge. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's surprising even to me because um, <laughs> uh, a few years ago I didn't give a darn about following. Right. And, um, I view it as just some sort of distraction. Um, my wife still views it as a distraction. Um, but what I've learned is that um, a following is huge. Um, so much of what I spend my time doing in academic history is to write and try and interview the way people think, how they learn, and, um, what they know in the world. And I realize that when you have a following, um, you can get your message out immediately. And that is just so powerful. It's um, uh, transformational that uh, I really enjoyed uh, getting a following, trying to find a um, people are 
about and um, finding some success there. I, even people who necessarily reach, uh, that's an exciting thing. It's, it's remarkable. I have really enjoyed watching what you've been doing on social media and what you've been doing um, with camp. What is it? Base camp? Barrow? It's, What's Barrow, it called? Barrow Base Camp. Yeah. Barrow Base Camp. And it's extraordinary to me. I've always had a tremendous fascination with the brain, as you and I have talked about, particularly because my grandfather was a neurosurgeon and I never had the opportunity to watch him work. To, to see him operate. Um, so what you're doing with Barra Base Camp, it took me a while to get used to being able to watch it. It's, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, but then once you can kind of transcend the fear of it and really see what's going on, it's kind of a whole other universe, kind of like when people go deep sea diving and they are so comfortable in the ocean and and, a, you know, it's a different sense of gravity and so forth. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your experience, perhaps even the first time you held a surgical instrument and, and worked on a live brain. Well, I think um, the scuba uh, example is a great I've always said that um, when, I do my, <clears throat> when I do my brain, it literally is like... <clears throat> um, falling into another world, immersing myself in another universe. Going underwater is the same kind of feeling because uh, I do scuba dive and um, when I go under, the, um, explore the coral and I look at the fish, do all that fun stuff, it really is like the way I operate. You, hmm. you feel like, um, falling into a world that you're not seeing, the vibrant, the the creatures there, the pulsations or the nerves traveling from one to the other. It's just an exquisite landscape and it really is scuba diving. So um, I find it to be, um, it's um, uh, just like diving. You don't dive because you're, you're always finding stuff and the technology that you're fixing patients is always changing. So um, really exciting and, and um, uh, alluring. <clears throat> now the base camp, uh, <clears throat> the base camp idea that uh, came out of, you know, just tapes of scuba diving um, is one um, and video clips of brain surgery is kind of like, I, I, I like um, wanted to take it to another level. Um, talk about sort of uh, strategy, what people see on a tape. So we, we kind of made the metaphor uh, basically where at the end of the day, around the fire, where you kind of uh, tell the story of the day or you talk about what went right or wrong for tomorrow's climb, uh, visions and the plan together. That same sort of feeling of fire that we come to every day. Capture that so much to um, um, what would be like a video that is um, sterile. I think it's fascinating. The, the, um, the work that you're doing, uh, particularly with the brain and, and my point of entry into our whole conversation, of course, has to do with the film that I'm making, Would You Hide Me? And I wouldn't be here talking to you if these two farmers who hid my mom and her siblings uh, hadn't hit her for two years. And the, the real, the burning question is what is happening in the brain when somebody makes such a brave and courageous decision? Mm. Yeah, um, that's a really tough question. For you. Um, uh, let me start by saying this. Um, if you're a brain surgeon, um, opening people's hands and operating on the brain, people just assume that you must know all of the answers. <laughs> I can tell you that uh, that's not true. I wish it were true. Um, I view myself as a glorified plumber. Uh, I <laughs> pipes, the pipes that throw, whatever. I wish I understood how bravery and emotions work 
Um, what I can tell you is that we know where those things are located. Uh, things like courage and bravery, the areas like the Abdullah uh, and the Hippocampus, those areas where emotional um, activities are located and uh, they derive their strength. Memory banks are right on the campus next to the area. So um, it's all motion is sort of like this loop and neurons fire these um, neurotransmitters emitted and it just creates sort of soup of uh, emotion that we don't really understand. So can you actually see, for example, when somebody has uh, inherited trauma or, or intergenerational trauma, can you actually see that in a brain? When you're, you know, I'm not talking emotionally, I'm talking about physically. You, you can see um, physical trauma. So if a patient has had skull for example. Of course. And fusion, then you'll see that, that's clear. Uh, if they've had some traumatic psychological experience, you won't see that. That stuff um, is the inner workings of the mind and the brain. You don't see any kind of uh, organic or physical uh, it's it's brain does it is able to collect all of these experiences all of these bits of information put them in some kind of an order and uh, you never know just by what's in there that was a question actually that i um, received from one of my uh advisors at a holocaust museum that i'm partnering with and she really wanted to know is inherited trauma something that physically alters the brain or not. And that leads me to questions about um, can bravery and courage be learned? Is it something that you inherit? And, and those kinds of questions. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I do think bravery is learned. Um, I think that um, surgery is actually a really good um, metaphor for what we're talking about. Um, I think it's true that when you begin as a surgeon, you're learning the basics of how to tie knots or make skin and skin and bring tissues together or separate parts so that you can see going. These are all basic um, metals of, of surgery. And when you start, I think all of us are very cautious, very fearful, and uh, not particularly brave or courageous. Um, move along your development, gain the, the skills, techniques, you, you become confident. And then that confidence translates to um, risk and your lead to courage and bravery. It's this whole cascade. And I, I think that, um, um, to think that you, you're not just given bravery out of the gate, something that comes along committed process of um, training and and uh, hard work. When did you realize that this is something that you wanted to do for your life's work? Um, I don't have a, a, a date or magical moment, but I can say that um, uh, when I was, I was attracted to medicine, this whole idea of biology and helping people, and also I was an engineer, uh, idea of Understanding the inner workings of the body, uh, working with the body, to, um, uh, do things like uh, make an artificial heart. Like when I was in college, that was how I saw my future was to be a heart design artificial heart. That. that that all came together so nicely for me. Um, but um, it wasn't there wasn't a moment. I, I just gravitated to neurosurgery through a series of uh, unrelated events. I got turned away from a cardiac surgery, done with my first year of medical school. And because they wouldn't let me in, I had to find some place to work. And that's how I first got my exposure to neurosurgery. And I met some people I really liked at the, the department at Johnson. They got me uh, committed to the field. And then I got to feed other people who got me turned into vascular neurosurgery rather than tumor surgery. And um, 
it's just a journey of uh, a bunch of random events, really. And uh, you're I mean, how lucky that you were turned away from the cardiac surgeon, because of course, I know how thrilled Barrow is to have you return. You did your residency there, is that correct? Yeah, so I trained in the 90s. It's a seven year train for those of you out there who think this is a short and quick uh, road. It, it takes a long time. It was seven years here. And I went to um, San Francisco where I uh, spent 20 years and uh, went over here, retired. Uh, was the first professor. Um, he offered that job and uh, it was hard for me to resist. Oh, for sure, for sure. So you're back in Arizona and you've done so many things even in the short time that you've returned. I mean, in, a, in addition to creating Barrow Base Camp, which is, seems quite novel, maybe there are other platforms out there that are specifically only for surgeons, um, but this is for everybody. People like me get to watch what you're doing. So that seems pretty novel. And you're doing it and you're posting on Instagram and stuff. So that's pretty novel. Um, but you've also, I, I don't know if it's, it's erected, if you've had like a ribbon cutting yet, but you've built another massive structure on the campus. Is that, is that right? Yeah, we, um, we're not done yet. So no ribbons have been cut, but it's coming. Right. Yeah, so that's happening. So that's, that's quite incredible. Um, and then what you've done even now during the pandemic, immediately, right out of the gate when the pandemic hit, you guys were creating platforms for PPE for other people to use. Yeah, um, it's been fun. You know, one of the things that I, I will talk about the whole um, process you mentioned is, you know, I, before I took this job, I was um, an academic professor writing up books papers, and doing my search and um and you know that was that was uh, pretty fulfilling but to take it to another level and become ceo and to run an it and to have a platform to do all of these other things has really been a lot of fun. i um must say that i was a little bit um uh hitting your blues and uh the, the antidote to that There's so many things here to uh, to work on um, the building, as you mentioned, the uh, new uh, teaching, to, um, creating, a, uh, uh, trying to shape the whole educational publishing uh, possibility here. There's just so much here that uh, I'm enjoying. Fun ride. That's so wonderful. There are also some things that I've seen where you're actually doing a lot of team building with your residents and going out into the wilderness doing hikes and climbs and so forth, and how special that must be for your team to have a leader like you to want to go and do these things that potentially might mirror fear or mirror um, needing some bravery and courage. I don't know what kind of, what kind of hikes and climbing you guys are doing, uh, but it just, I thought, I thought that was unique and, and interesting. Yeah, well, uh, so one of the hikes that we do is the Grand Canyon. Like uh, uh, the Grand Canyon, uh, it's a long 25-mile hike. And so um, that uh, is things where um, we do this, we come together as a team. We, and um, I, your point about courage, it, it is helpful to um, get people out to um, push them a little bit and make them do things that they either never did before or didn't think that could do. And I, I believe that that makes um, these young surgeons better surgeons. Uh, first of all, but second of all, to believe in themselves and to know take a tall task. For sure. The, the climbing and stuff, it reminds me, of course, of Free Solo. You and I talked about Free Solo before. And you know, the incredible courage and bravery it takes for someone to want to do something like climb the face of El Capitan. I mean, that's just extraordinary. And we had talked a little bit about the sequence in the film where he has his, he take, gets an MRI and he has a scientist study his brain and really evaluate his amygdala and understand why perhaps he might want to, he's such a thrill seeker and, um, and, and, well, how, and, and why it's different for him. 
that's have is it ever a common thing for surgeons such as yourself to want to study your own brains to, to perhaps understand why you want to do something that for most people is like completely out of their wheelhouse yeah i would love to get a functional mri i'm doing surgery just to see it um i don't really know, and it would be really to understand that uh, I think that the movie uh, fascinating. Uh, I think that um, it gives a lot of insight into um, where this um, locus in the brain is is um, where uh, some of the traits reside. That's important. But um, one of the things that I really loved about the movie was how he was committed. Uh, this is Alex uh, Henold. Um, to getting up El Capitan, that he studied every move, um, every step along the way, and cracked, contoured his body, make that next pivot or move. And it's really uh, like that in surgery. I think um, in so many ways, doing a difficult operation, same process, breaking down those different steps and stringing them together, figuring out what's the most dangerous one, where is it going to be, Critical moment. Um, prove your chance of getting through that uh, that particular step. And that's so much of what goes into successful surgery. I, I just thought it was a beautiful uh, metaphor for for the operative world. I agree. There, it, later in the film, after the MRI sequence, but much later, and he's kind of debriefing with one of his colleagues at the end of the day and after or preparing for the next time he's going up, he talks about the sequence of the hand and the foot. And it's as if he's got the entire thing memorized, kind of how I memorize a script when I'm preparing for a play or a film or something. And I would imagine that that's, is that what you're talking about with surgery? You almost have the entire sequence just memorized, but of course you're gonna have things that come up that you have to deal with in the moment, um, but at least there's the plan in place. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, you see a, a patient, with a brain aneurysm, when you're going to do something very complicated, like you have to study um, so many different things. You have to study what the arteries go the aneurysm look like, how the coming out look, what the actual shape of the aneurysm, how are you going to bring new arteries to make up for blood flow that's lost by whatever you need to do to close. And all of these little things need to be kind of looked at, analyzed. Can this technique work for that particular problem? And, and it really is the sequence of, um, first of all, developing the plan and the strategy, and then the, every, every um, one of these operations, uh, I like to say, has a thousand steps. And if one of those steps are perfectly, then the whole journey can be um, that task that uh, needs the flow when you finish may be blocked and it may flow. Um, uh, it really requires that not only you think about that, but then you execute and make sure that everything goes just right. And I think um, that gets to the real heart of this whole bravery question. You know, um, it, it's a hard thing to take difficult cases. It, it's, um, it's one simple operation where there isn't a lot of risk, everything's predictable. But um, when you're really tough and um, taking um, big risk, then um, it, it really does take courage. And it does take a different kind of surgeon, just in the way it takes a different climate uh, to make that happy town without a rope. Mm. <laughs> kind, of, kind of metaphor. Right, for sure. Do you find that your edge changes? I mean, you've been doing this a long time and watching you talking to your students, you are so comfortable with, with what you're saying. And so one has to just know that if they get lucky enough, if, first of all, nobody wants to be your patient necessarily, let's just say that. But if they get lucky enough to be your patient, they know that they're in such confident and assured hands that everything will go as well as it possibly can. So what is your edge right now when it comes to courage and bravery? Well, um, 
think um, I touched on it earlier, and that's experience. You know, I, I feel like the more I do this, um, the better I get. And um, I, I learn more, you no know, can and can't be done. Um, I've made mistakes in the past, I've learned, and I'm better from the result. I think um, that experience, that magical force that um, the, a good surgeon or makes a good surgeon a brave surgeon, that's experience that's really hard to come up. Um, and it's also a tough topic because, you know, how do you, how do you get that? You, you have to just find learning curves, um, do all the things that go in gaining experience that are difficult to talk about. Um, I, I've got experience and I um, wish I could say that every operation I do goes just the way I do, but it's not true. Uh, have complications that happen that um, are unexpected. Um, and, uh, they're, they're devastating. They, they become sometimes more devastating the more experience you get because you don't expect to have uh, complications. Mm. I feel like you should be having making mistakes. You made them. You've learned. Them. Yet sometimes, even after a perfect operation, you can have. And um, that's particularly hard. And it leads to this revelation that bravery. I, I'm. I can talk about being brave, but I think a lot of the bravery patient. Patient is who suffers the kind. You know, we may take take on that tough case, but um, you know, I, I always reflect on the patient who actually does that, and uh, sometimes I feel like you know are shielded. Agree. Mm. You know, we we just have a few minutes left here, and I know that you have a very very busy schedule, so I don't want to keep you on too long, but. I want to talk for this. My one last question is really about what you say at the very end of your spinal dural arteriovenous fistula uh, video. And you talk about how what you're doing today, you, you're, you're questioning yourself. What is it that we're doing today that's wrong that we know that can be fixed in the future. You said it much more eloquently than I just did right now, but I have a feeling you know what, what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, that's a great case because um, we just um, treated these 20 years ago differently because we didn't understand it. And um, I, I have to believe that there are things that we do today that um, we won't be doing 20 years as we've got a new device our understanding change or whatever. And it, it's just a really interesting um, position to be in where a field is evolving before our eyes. And mm -hmm. uh, what we're developing today um, can change everything tomorrow. And so with that passage, of time, I'm certain that there will be things that I'm doing today that aren't being done. And I know it, my, my whole field of anger is what I would call a shrinking field. It's because the particular competitive therapies are becoming better and better, and they're challenging the status quo. And so um, the things we do now are going to be done far less and may not even be done at all. So in that sense, you know, I kind of have viewed myself as one of these last camera tours that um, needs to... Um, you know, keep doing what I am doing because I believe that else bear me out. But I realize that if that, that the world needs people who have gone down, made these, um, learned these lessons, and can then teach the next generation has, because um, we're becoming fewer and fewer. I, I, that never even would have occurred to me. That's that's yeah. fascinating. It's almost like the, uh, since we're. Arizona now. It's like the Native American culture. It's a culture that um, is threatened. It's shrinking. Mm. Um, uh, the population is shrinking and um, more those uh, Native Americans are leaving their lands. And so in, in the same way, uh, it's easy to view open search in the same context. Uh, 
worried that we could lose all of these cultural gains through um, uh, of study and, uh, and, and learn. Well, it is, it is truly an, an honor and a pleasure for me to A, just get to see you. It's super fun. And, and really for you to agree to come on to Banter with Beth and talk about your philosophy, your, what you're doing to fight the good fight, um, everything that you have contributed to the world of medicine. It's remarkable and it's to be applauded. And I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. Well, Beth, it's great to see you. It's always fun to uh, see you because I just think back uh, years ago in uh, Winnetka on the North Shore. In high school, I, it's like a time machine seeing you and being transported to that. It's true. It's very true. Um, I'm, I'm impressed that you are still as physically active as you are. I remember, I remember when we were kids going running. I think you were on the track team or something. And, and I went running with you one day and I was like, oh my God, I can't even keep up. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we all go our different paths and mine went much towards the dance world and, um, and you've become, you know, the cyclist doing what you're doing every morning, which is pretty exciting. But thank you so much for taking the time and taking an interest in what I'm doing. I am fascinated by what you're doing and, uh, and I'm just very, very grateful. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Good, good. And we'll make sure that you get a replay so you can actually see yourself. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Michael Lawton. And thank you to the Barrow Neurological Institute for uh, lending us Dr. Lawton for a half an hour of his time. We really, really are very, very grateful. I hope everybody has a wonderful day. All right. Thanks, Beth. Bye. Bye. So we are, um, I'm, I'm saying goodbye to everybody. That was the incredible Dr. Michael Lawton. I am, I am just honored that he joined us today. I'm thrilled to have everybody on here. Thank you for showing up for him. Thank you for showing up for me. I'm just reading a, a note here. All of Dr. Lawton's videos can be found on youtube.com slash bearer neurological um, for sure. Definitely. Just, just Google Dr. Michael Lawton or Barrow Neurological Institute. Google uh, Barrow Base Camp and you'll come up, you'll see these extraordinary videos. And, um, and Banter with Beth, we are taking, a, are we taking a break this Sunday? Gosh, I should be looking at my own schedule. What's the matter with me? But we really have an amazing lineup that is, uh, that's coming at us. Uh, let me see here. Just so that everybody knows, we've got Ted Rose. We've got Carla Hassett. Carla Hassett's next Wednesday. Carla also from the North Shore of Chicago and a new Trier East graduate, classmate of mine. Carla has a new single out called Change that's phenomenal. Just Google CarlaHassett.com. Uh, after that, we have the uh, wonderful composer. Uh, Ted Rosenthal, who is coming on to talk about his jazz opera, Dear Eric, which takes place uh, during World War II. And then after that, we have Liz Vogel, the executive director of Facing History and Ourselves. So we've got a really great lineup coming. Um, oh, and then after Liz Vogel, we have uh, my friend Susie Snyder, who's curator for the last 29 years at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. So stay tuned. Keep joining us. Please hit like afterwards. Um, I see that a lot of Dr. Lawton's uh, friends have come on, so I hope you'll follow us as well. And very grateful to everybody for tuning in to Badger with Beth in support of Would You Hide Me? And um, we'll, we'll see you next Wednesday. Bye. <laughs>